Everything in life is a lot more fun with an oversized LEGO version of it. Our gigantic LEGO NES controller is no different. Best part is it's surprisingly easy to make, and we'll be showing you how to do that today. The way we have this set up, our NES controller is seen as nothing more than a gigantic keyboard. The A and B buttons are seen as literally A and B on a keyboard, as well as the D-pad as up, down, left, and right. This works perfectly well with our emulation software, as well as anything else. If I wanted to, I could open up a notepad and type the letter A over and over again, but that's not much fun. If an NES controller isn't your thing, you can easily make your own system, and instead of having an A letter being pressed, you can change our code so that you have a key command shortcut to open up a program. Imagine hitting a big Lego button on your desktop and your email pops up. Or a silly sound effect is played. It's all the same when it comes down to it in the software. You only need nine electronic parts to actually make this thing work. Eight of them being the buttons and one being the control board. And shameless plug here, these are all part of our Crazy Circuit system that can be found at crazycircuits.com. So if you like this, you could totally make it yourself out of your own spare components or buy our system since our system is LEGO compatible from the get-go. That big board you see down there in the bottom left is our Crazy Circuits touch board. That's an Arduino compatible board with built-in capacitive touch. While we're not using the capacitive touch feature, we do use it for the input as it has built-in keyboard emulation on it. Simple and easy to do, or you can, again, make your own version with another Arduino compatible board, though it might not work with our software. By far, the most difficult aspect of this project was literally making up the LEGO design file. Luckily, LEGO has some really nice software they put out there for free that made designing it pretty quick and easy, if not a good evening's worth of work. We designed our controller with a hinge, this way we could open and close it and monkey around with stuff if need be. The D-pad is connected by a simple ball joint, again all LEGO. The start and select as well as the A and B are just free floating there held in place by the upper level. As you can see everything just clearly fits together, there's nothing fancy about it. The only downside is it's kind of a little bit fragile, which, well, not a big deal as long as you don't plan on dropping it frequently. You can grab this LEGO design file from us off our GitHub repository or our website. From there you can get a full list of all the LEGOs you need to make this exact same project. However, be warned, we got all of ours off BrickOwl.com and it was about $130 worth of gray and black LEGOs. That's no small amount. So we actually came up with a second, smaller version of this for people who don't want to go through the craziness of building this entire gigantic system. This is the smaller version we came up with. It's sitting on an 8x16 sized LEGO plate. We're using six micro switches that are quite tall, as well as our microcontroller up top, same as in our big uh, NES controller. Our Crazy Circuit system is designed to easily fit on top of LEGOs, as you can see here. They fit on pretty loose from the get-go, but the tape helps fill whatever gap there is, and they're pressure fit in place, and they hold on nice and secure. If we wanted to, we could use the controller just the way it is, however, that's not all too interesting or very ergonomic. It rather hurts your hands trying to play it this way. So we took it a step further and designed a nice laser cut enclosure for it. You can find the design files for our laser cut controller and several variations of it uh, on our GitHub repository. If you want to, you can buy the crazy circuits parts from us, but we also have those as open source files as well. You could use such services as Osh Park to make your own or modify the files and make some interesting other version of them. Wiring up the gigantic NES controller was a little bit more difficult than wiring up the small version. One big annoying aspect was trying to figure out where to put the darn microcontroller. While my touchboard fit many different places, uh, none of them worked as well as I'd originally planned. Spaces were way too tight, things didn't fit properly, so I had to go back to the drawing board and change a few things around for my initial design. I ended up adding a couple extra rows of LEGO, being held down by double-sided tape. This allowed me to fit the Crazy Circuits touchboard on top naturally the way it was designed to be done, and gave me some, well, much-needed leverage. So while that wasn't the most ideal, it tended to work out pretty well. I might go back and redesign the original file, but for now it works perfect. Our go-to connector for Crazy Circuits is our conductive nylon tape. 
This stuff is great. It's super strong and can take a lot of abuse. It also comes on and off pretty easy if you mess up like I've done a few times. I first started out by putting a common ground around the outside of the controller. This gave me a starting point for wiring everything up, as well as something to avoid when wiring up the board to all the buttons later on. The A and B buttons were relatively simple to wire up. I double checked them both with a multimeter uh, just to make sure and the connections were nice and strong. I'm glad I went with 12mm push buttons uh, for the inside of this thing. Their nice large contact area made lining everything up a whole lot easier. To be honest, was a, they were a lot more forgiving than the smaller micro ones I was using in the other controller. I wove the conductive tape in and out of our big Lego holes on our circuit boards. I then kept everything onto the controller by using more double-sided foam tape. Again, not the most elegant, but it keeps everything nice and secure even after taking on the road several times. The D-pad proved to be a little bit more difficult. However, it's just more of the same. Each of the buttons is wired to the common ground along the outside edge, as well as the crazy touch board by another piece of conductive tape. It helped position our buttons so that the D-pad came in contact with the middle of the button. This made for the most secure clicks as well as, well, just good contact. To make sure they didn't have any short circuits, I actually ran our conductive tape over the top of our crazy touch board before I ran them over to our start and select buttons. I double checked everything with a multimeter just to be sure that everything was registering properly. I only had one problematic button, the select, but that was something that was easy to fix. Overall, not tough to make, just time consuming. From the get-go, I had set up the crazy touch board so that each of the inputs were the same as the default for our emulation software. So the A was A, the B was B. But again, I could always change it to something different for different needs, different programs. As I've mentioned before, all the files needed to make this, as well as code and supplies, can be found at crazycircuits.com. They can also be found at our GitHub repository under the name Brown Dog Gadgets. We'll have links here you can click on if you need those. It'd be very easy to do different variations of this project with different materials, especially since our crazy touch board is set up for capacitive touch. One project idea was to make a gigantic floor Nintendo controller using conductive paint. This way we could barefoot play Mario, but that's a project for a different video. If you have any questions or comments or have an idea for a new project, let us know. Otherwise, happy building out there, and we look forward to seeing other people's gigantic LEGO Nintendo controllers in the future.